just like a sailor. Could it be our boys done something rash? Nice, said Jenny Diver. Whoop, whoop. Whoa, Suki Tawdry. Ooh, Miss Lana Linya. And old Lucy Brown. Yes, that line forms on the right bay. And now that Maggie's back in town, I said Jenny Diver. Whoa, Suki Tawdry. Look out to Miss Lana Linya and old Lucy Brown. Yes, that line forms on the right babe. And now that Maggie's back in time. Look out, old Maggie's back. All right, well, thank you, everybody. So it's, I, I picked that song because it's kind of like me, like, you know, old school, you know, people are like, Bob, why don't you do Megadeth or something? You know, and it's just like, right. All right, so that song kind of represents what we're trying to do here. Old school, but a little risque, talks about sex and violence, but kind of in an old-fashioned, dorky way. All right, so the next portion of tonight's show is what I like to call Be Afraid, Be Very Afraid. And here I just want to run through some of the numbers so you guys understand why it is that a lot of free market economists Guys, including the Schiffs, and I, I think I see Andrew. Let's give a hand for Andrew Schiff here, everybody. <laughs> and, and again, just so you guys know, I'm saying this so people understand that celebrities show up at these events, right? So you need to come to Pork Fest. Ding! All right. That was my teeth glistening. That wasn't me getting a kickback. So in this, in this uh, portion, let me talk about... The, uh, the, the fiscal situation, all right? Let's run through some of the numbers so you guys understand why it is that a lot of free market economists, particularly those of the Austrian school, are very concerned about th uh, the situation and why we think it's important that people learn Austrian economics and understand at least the basics of it so you can see just how bad things are, are at the moment. Okay, let's talk for a moment about the federal government's debt, all right? Now, the numbers they throw around when they talk about that, you know, debt to GDP ratio and those things, Depending on what they're looking, it's 14 trillion in that area. The, the debt limit right now is like 16 and a half trillion, something like that. They're, they keep bumping it up. But that number just refers to the actual amount of obligations that the U.S. Treasury has formally issued, right? So the U.S. Treasury issues bonds saying we're going to borrow money from people and then you owe us, or we owe you money back, and that's what the bond is. That's what people are talking about when they say, the federal government has outstanding something like you know, 16, 17 trillion dollars. That's what that number is. But if you ask in terms of the legally binding obligations that they've made just in terms of Social Security and Medicare, well then the number is, is much bigger, okay? And so there, the, the government's own accountants, when they look at that, they, um, they say that over the next 75 years, the shortfall between Social Security and Medicare obligations, what they're taking out of people's paychecks and what they expect to have to pay, that shortfall over the next 75 years is projected to be uh, something of the order of $39 trillion, okay? So let me make sure you understand, you probably are misunderstanding what that number means. The number means that it's, uh, if, it's not saying how much do they owe. That's not what the question is, it's not saying how much do we think we're going to have to pay out? The question is saying, over time, they're taking money out of our paychecks to fund Social Security and Medicare, and then they also have to pay benefits to people based on how old they are and how much they earn and so forth. And they're saying that gap over the next 75 years is going to be $39 trillion, and they're looking at it, they're taking the present value of it. So what they mean is right now, if the government had to set aside a bunch of money to roll over at interest to fund that shortfall over the next seven years, they would need right now an extra 39 trillion to play with. And again, these are the government's own figures, okay? So you can understand the, uh, the, the worry there, all right? The, the, the government's announcing this, so you know the actual number is much bigger. Okay, so that's what people are talking about when they say these, uh, this underfunding crisis in Social Security and Medicare. Let's move on to uh, what the Federal Reserve has been doing. So if you know what Austrian business cycle theory is, the Austrians say 
that what happened during the boom bust cycle uh, was that in the late 1990s, there was an unsustainable boom in the dot com and NASDAQ stocks. That crashed. And then what should have happened is the government and the Federal Reserve should have stayed back and just let things work themselves out. And there would have been a bad recession, and that would have been the end of it. But instead, what happened is that the uh, Alan Greenspan, who at the time was called the maestro, he brought interest rates down to uh, 1% and held them there for a year. And that gave us a housing bubble. And at the time, some of you may remember this, they called Greenspan the maestro. Right? They were saying, oh, wow, we can't believe that he engineered a boom in housing amidst this, what should have been a bad recession. But you can see that that was a mistake, right? that what happened, what he did at best was just postpone the inevitable, and he made it that much worse. So what should have been just a bad stock market bust in the early 2000s instead ended up being the massive crisis in 2008. So if you understand that story, now you can see why things are so bad right now, because what uh, what Bernanke has done is what Greenspan did, except so much worse. That Greenspan brought interest rates down to 1%, held them there for a year. Bernanke has brought interest rates down to basically 0%, held them there for several years, and promises to hold them there indefinitely into the future. All right, so you can see that, but it's even worse than that. Because with interest rates, once you get down to basically zero, you can't push them down any lower. Right, because the way the Fed pushes down interest rates is it goes into the credit markets and buys up government debt by creating new money, and that pushes down the interest rate. But once the interest rates get to basically zero, I'm talking about what's called the nominal rate, it can't go any lower, because you wouldn't say to somebody here, uh, let me lend you $100 and you give me 95 back next year. You wouldn't do that, because you would just hold the 100. So if you look at the amount of money that was pumped in, you can see, get a better sense of what Bernanke has done. And there, if you've seen these charts, I sure, many of you, if you haven't, just Google and look at uh, Federal Reserve Monetary Base chart, and you'll see that there's a chart like this, and it's boom, and it goes like that. And it's because Bernanke has more than tripled the amount of base money that the Fed pumps in. So what that means in the Austrian perspective, if you understand that interest rates serve a, a function to coordinate uh, production and investment with people's cons uh, savings behavior, you can see that they've set the world economy up for a huge crash, all right? And so this is uh, why people are so concerned coming from the Austrian perspective. That, let me put it to you this way. If, if what uh, Greenspan had done was take what should have been a NASDAQ bursting bubble, given us a housing bubble, then that in 2008 should have led to the downfall of major investment banks. And that's why they said, well, we need to do this stuff because otherwise these major banks are gonna go down. But if they hadn't done that, then those banks would have gone down. They did do it. They spared us that. But what I'm saying is they just sowed the seeds for a crisis that's going to be that much worse. So in 2008, people looking back in the early 2000s would have said, oh, if only we had had the NASDAQ bubble bursting, that would have been a walk in the park compared to how awful things are in 2008. So the, the, the concern is that's what's going to happen in 2015, 2016, whenever this thing comes to fruition, is that at that time people are going to look back at 2008 and say, oh man, if only we had you know, had major investment banks go down, that would have been a walk in the park compared to now you know, major governments around the world defaulting, and then even currencies like the euro and the dollar. All right, so that's uh, the perspective. So let me now uh, just segue a little bit, because I know that that's very depressing as a buzzkill, Let's now give the case for optimism, though, all right, that uh, there's lots of developments in the liberty movement of people who are uh, having all sorts of innovations. All the things that people are doing here at Porkfest in particular, just showing ways we can grow out of that, all right? And so I think that it, you don't want to get bogged down in pessimism. You don't want to uh, just focus on it. There is going to be, if the Austrians are right, and I think they are, at some point there's going to be a day of reckoning. There's going to be a big crash. And so you guys have to be ready for it. But a lot of you, you know, being young people, your best asset is your mind. And what you need to do is just look around and see opportunities and what you can do to provide value to people and get paid accordingly. All right, so those things will adjust with the level of price inflation. And so, you know, it's, it's going to be bad, and you need to do things like get gold and silver and all sorts of other things that we can talk about afterwards. 
But the point is, uh, being knowledgeable about what's coming, at least you can prepare yourself, and then you can get through it. All right. So, again, just if you don't know what if you don't know the kind of things I'm talking about, please go look and, and Google Austrian business cycle theory. Read about these things. Go to YouTube and look up. Peter Schiff was right, and you can see that people did see the last crisis coming and responded accordingly so that we can be ready because, again, this is going to be bad. The, what the governments and central banks have been doing has been the exact wrong thing, and we, we can't undo what they did. There's going to be a day of reckoning, but at least we can try to recover uh, from it. And th the important thing is we have to educate people so that when it does happen, it doesn't get blamed on the free market because you know that's going to happen. Right? You know that people are going to say when things collect, you know, if some Republican gets elected, they're going to, and he, and he cuts spending by 0.1% or something, you know, they're going to say, oh, see, that, that's what it was. It was the austerity. Let me just very briefly talk about that in case there are people who are still thinking the Republican Party is the, the salvation for our country. Um, I, I, I beg to differ. And the reason is, and I, and I used to think that stuff too. And the reason, I mean, I, I used to believe, you know, when, when uh, the, oh, it's, we have a Republican in the White House, and it's because of those Democrats in Congress, and they're the ones keeping us back. And, and that's, that's obviously not the right thing, to, the way to think about it, because we had Bush in there, and he had both houses, and still spending went through the roof, all right? Let me give you one last little tidbit on that. Paul Ryan, you guys know who Paul Ryan is? All right, so he is supposed to be the Republican hero. He's supposed to be like one of the conservative intellectual leaders. His budget plan that he released in 2012 for, for fiscal year 2013, if you go through that thing, this was like their wish list, right? This was, they knew it wasn't going to pass, but this is what the Republicans were proposing as opposed to that wild, crazy, big spender Obama. And in that uh, document, the Ryan plan that everyone, you know, in terms of our press coverage was denouncing as these wild draconian budget cuts. In that document, the budget wasn't going to be balanced until the year 2040. All right? So you can understand just how uh, bad things are when the Republican draconian budget cutting thing balances the budget in the year 2040, and that's what's being denounced as insane budget cuts. Okay, so th that's uh, just a snapshot of, of the situation and what we, I think we need to do to, to sort of grow out of it. And now, uh, is, is John Bush around? John, are you here? Okay, are you ready? Okay, so now we're gonna move on to a little uh, karaoke duet battle. Tatiana, are you still in here? Okay, so everyone, uh, at the karaoke event on Tuesday, uh, John and I, how many people were here for that? Okay, great. So John and I had a little uh, exchange, and and then he uh, hey, let me get these guys ready. And by all accounts, I was the winner of that event. But John uh, wants to come back in and, and and try his medal again. And so what we're going to do, without, just to spare you guys a little bit, we're going to have a professional singer also integrated in the mix. So John's going to do a duet with Tatiana. Also, Tatiana's playing tonight, so please come her and see an actual real musician if you're interested in that stuff. And uh, so John's going to go, and then uh, Tatiana and I are going to do a little song for you guys as well. All right, so you guys, are you, are you guys set on your end? Rock and roll! We never practiced this before. Bob didn't tell us what song he was doing. He's probably got something smooth up his sleeve. They've been practicing for six months. <laughs> All right, this is for you guys. Everybody looks really beautiful tonight, by the way. Vote for me. You'll get freedom. Rand Paul. 2016. Can we roll it back? Can we start it over? Can we roll it back? She sounds good. We got hecklers in the crowd. Was that Mandrick back there? 
this is way too work. high for me. You're already at a disadvantage. Summer loving had me a blast. Summer loving happened so fast. I met a girl crazy for me. I met a boy cute as can be. Summer days drifting away to a of a summer night. Well, well, well. Tell me more, tell me more. Did you get very far? Tell me more, tell me more. I'd like to see you have a car. <laughs> she got a cramp. He ran by me, got my suit down. I saved a life, she nearly drowned. He showed off, slashing around. Summer sun, something's begun, but oh, oh, the summer nights. Oh, well, oh, well, oh, well. Oh. Tell me more, tell me more, was it love at first sight? Tell me more, tell me more, did she put up a fight? Shoot a bop, bop, yeah. Shoot a bop, bop, ah, shoot a bop, bop, uh, yeah. Oh. I took a bowling in the arcade. We went strolling. We made out, she sucked my We said how we took a Summer fling don't mean a thing But up on oh, the summer night Well, well, well Tell me more, tell me more But you don't gotta brag Tell me more, tell me more Cause this thing sounds like a drag Shoot a bop bop, shoot a bop bop, yeah. Shoot a bop bop, shoot, shoot a bop bop, shoot, shoot a bop bop, yeah. Shoot a bop, shoot a bop, man. Well, she got friendly down in the sand, yeah. He was sweet, just turned 18. Well, she was good, if you know what I mean. Summer heat, boy and girl meet, but oh, all the summer nights, oh. Tell me more, tell me more, could she give me a friend? It turned colder, that's where it ends. So I told her we'd still be friends. Then we made our true love vow. I wonder what she's doing now summer dreams ripped at the seams oh, but, oh, the All right, let's give it up for John Bush. Okay, now I could play it safe because Santi and I have done lots of duets. You know, like I've had the time of my life from Dirty Dancing all the time. You know, you and know, I would do the chilling, lift of her at the twins. end. You know, what I'm talking about. But we're not, you know, that, that wouldn't be nearly as entertaining as the following. So I encourage everyone to get this on their iPhone because it's either going to be really cool or it's going to be so bad that you're going to be glad that you've got it on your iPhone. Oh, All right. Please don't get out your iPhone. It's okay. <laughs> okay, so I'll point to like what, who's doing what. You're starting it. Okay. I'll follow your lead. Nobody does it better Makes me feel sad for the rest Nobody does it half as good as you Bobby, you're the best <laughs> I wasn't looking, but somehow you found me. I tried to hide from your love life. Well, 
like heaven above me The spy who loved me Is keeping all my secrets safe tonight Nobody does it better Though sometimes I wish someone could Nobody does it quite the way you do Why'd you have to be so good? The way that you hold me Whenever you hold me Is some kind of magic inside That keeps me from running But just keep it coming How'd you learn to do the things you do? Nobody does it better Makes me feel sad for the rest Nobody does it half as good as you, baby, Bobby, darling, you're the best, baby, you're the best, baby, you're the best. Now, let's give a hand for them. All right, now that was, that was very brave of Tatiana to do that because she's actually a professional singer. A lot of professional, yeah, let's give a hand for her for doing that. Okay, if you guys thought, okay, that's not what I was expecting, just wait, it gets worse. <laughs> All right, so uh, this next thing, what we're going to do here is I want to just reenact some of my favorite movie clips, and I'm going to need audience participation. So I'm going to bring people up from the audience, and they're going to work with me here, do some of my favorite movie clips. Now, again, I, there's a couple reasons for this. Oh, you want me to make an announcement. Taryn wants people who are in the agorist pitch that's happening on this at 8 o'clock after, he wants to meet with you. All right, so let me say that in case I forget also that after this, please stick around. Uh, Taryn's going to be doing his agorist pitch. Uh, that's what's coming on next. All right, so at this point, I want to bring people up. And, and the, the function of this, uh, again, say what you will, I understand that it's, it's a little bit odd, okay? So just think about all the, the comments. When this goes up on YouTube, just I am going to get torn a new one on this thing. And it's okay, though. I do it for liberty, you know? That, that's what I do. And part of what I'm doing here is I'm trying to get people to break. I mean, let me put it this way. What we've been doing has not been working very well, right? All right, the government has been getting more and more powerful, and so we know our ideas are right, and it's, we've been making good inroads in certain respects, but, you know, it's, I'm trying to, like, get people to brainstorm and come up with other ways to sort of get this thing out. So, again, what I want is, in this YouTube video, when people send it to somebody, somebody's going to be watching it and think I'm insane, you know, the views I'm talking about, the economics and political views, but then maybe one of these things they're going to say, I can't believe that crazy ball guy just did that in front of 100 people. That's amazing. So I'm, let, me, let me read his book and see what he has to say, because someone that nuts must be onto something, all right? So that's partly what's here. The other thing is, I know plenty of you, deep down, you have ideas, things you want to do, but you're afraid, right? You don't want to do it. It's kind of like you go to the karaoke bar, and people are really good, and you don't want to get up there, and then some guy gets up there, and it's just a train wreck, and then you feel comfortable doing it yourself, all right? 
So whatever happens, whether you guys like it or you don't, just let this be a little nudge. Like, you too can take a risk. Okay. So the first one here, I need, uh, it's got to be a guy, a volunteer. You have to be Indiana Jones. All right. So who wants to be Indiana Jones? Okay. <laughs> All right. Come on up. Indy, cover your heart. All right. We love you, Cowboys. I know you do, baby. Okay, now let's just make sure. Do you understand what you what you're in for here? You're at you're at Pork Fest. You're on the stage with me, Bob Murphy. And you're about to do Indiana Jones. You have died and gone to nerd heaven. You understand that? All right. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, this is great. And the thing is, I bet someone here has a whip, right? I know Taron Lupo does, but that's private. Okay. <laughs> okay, so hang on, we gotta confer. <laughs> Don't turn it around. It's, <laughs> it's just the more. It's just the more. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Junior, you're going the wrong way. Berlin is that way. <laughs> Bobby's this way. <laughs> but my, my diary is in Berlin. Bobby's this way. <laughs> See, the only way this is going to work is if you read the script. <laughs> This isn't the improv show right here. We're... It's not the guy with crazy hair variety show, all right? Do you understand? So you're Indy, in right. highlight. Oh, he's unschooled, that's what it is. Uh... Brody's this way. What? Yeah, Brody's this way, then I'm saying that. I... I, but that's what I said. What? Okay, let's okay. try it again. Okay. All right. <laughs> Brody's this way. But my <laughs> diary's in Berlin. <laughs> okay, and then you read the next line. It goes back and forth. Ah, uh, okay, all right, all right, yeah, that's right, all right. <laughs> You don't need the dragged dad. Marcus has this map. All right, we have to end by eight. All right, all right. We got okay. this. No, no, we got all this. Right. You and me, Bob. The, We're gonna do this. All right, let's just get to this. Okay. There's more to the diary than just the map. All right, Dad. Tell me. Well, he who finds the grail must first surpass three tests of lethal cunning. Booby traps. Oh yes, but I've discovered the secrets to unlock these booby traps. What are they? Can't you remember? I wrote them in my diary, so I wouldn't have to remember, Junior. Thank you, everyone. That was my Sean Connery. <laughs> All right. Well, let's give a hand for this gentleman. I think we all learned something about spontaneous order. That. Okay. For the next two, I actually picked these people beforehand, and now we see why. <laughs> hey, is Antigone, are you still in here? <laughs> Let's give a hand for Antigone. <laughs> okay. Now, th these people agreed to do this though without knowing what they were getting into, so it's very brave. Okay, you got this. Why don't you stand over here? You got this? All right, then I got it. There's actually props in this one. This is a high budget production. I have to put this robe on. Talk amongst yourselves. I'll give you a topic. The Federal Reserve, neither federal nor reserve. Discuss. <laughs> Are
Are you a ghost, too? I'm the ghost of the most, babe. You know, you look like somebody I can relate to. Maybe you can help me get out of here, because I got down this old death thing well. It's just so creepy. Here's my problem. I got this friend on the outside, you know, little mediums, kind of think I'd be there in person, you know what I mean? So if you could just help me get out of here, I'd really appreciate it. I want to get in. Why? Well, I'm sure you got your reasons, but the thing is, from over here, I can't do anything. Now, if you get me out there, maybe we can talk or something, work something out. But for any of that to happen, you need to say my name three times. What's your name? Well, uh, I can't tell you. Why not? Well, I'll tell you why. I tell you, you tell your friends, they're always calling me up at the horn, asking me to show up at shopping center, sign autographs, rent over, something like that. Makes my life a hell, okay? All living hell. Thank you, everyone. That was my Beetlejuice. Now, you know, when that much talent flows through my body, it, it wants to shut down like a circuit breaker, and I just have to fight that natural tendency for self-preservation to keep the show going. But it's a sacrifice I make for you guys. All right, let's do one more of these particular things. I should probably take the robe off. All right, uh, Naomi, are you still around, and more importantly, still willing to do this? <laughs> just say no. Okay, so she, she's a very intelligent girl. She doesn't need a script. Bob, are you happy? Of course I'm not happy. Look at me. I got bigger boobies than you do. I'm a fat slob. I haven't seen my willy in three years, and that's long enough to declare legally dead. I can't stop eating. I eat because I'm happy. I'm uh, uh, happy because I eat. If you'll excuse me, there's someone I need to get in touch with and forgive myself. Thank you, everyone. All right, all right. Next, I'm going to try something here. Uh, it's going to be, you guys familiar with the Wheels Off Liberty podcast? Yeah! All right. And so a couple of years ago, I gave those guys a $5 donation, and they canceled their show like a week later. So I always thought that the show should continue, and so in my mind, you know, th this, is, uh, this is how it would go. You're listening to the Wheels Off Liberty podcast. I'm Jamie, and I'm Brett. Hey, Brett, what you drinking, old man? Well, Jamie, I'm drinking good old H2O. H2, is that some kind of funky new homebrew? No, Jamie, it's water. Two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen. Oh, well, bro, you must not be very thirsty then, right? I mean, them atoms is really small. <laughs> no, no, Jamie, I just gave you the formula for one molecule of water. There's lots of molecules in this glass. Oh, okay, well, uh, I was never very good at chemistry. Yeah, uh, listen, Jamie, before we uh, lose our last three listeners, why don't you go ahead and, and tell me the story you were talking about before the show started? I think some of our listeners might like that. Yeah, okay, good job, right? Okay, sure thing. So, dude, you would not believe. The other day, I was out at a Mexican restaurant, right, throwing back a few brewskis. I had to take care of some business. I go into the bathroom, pull out my baby maker, take care of my business. I go to wash my hands, and, dude, you would not believe there on the mirror was a sign from the Oklahoma Department of Health that said, employees must wash hands. Brett, have you ever heard of such tyranny? <laughs> <laughs> look, look, Jamie, I'm as big a, a critic of government intervention with business as the next guy, but I mean, I kind of think in the, in the grand scheme of things, a sign from the Oklahoma Department of Health on the wind, a mirror of a bathroom saying employees must wash hands is fairly innocuous, don't you think? Innocuous? Is that like when they stick your arm for tuberculosis? <laughs> Um, no, Jamie, you're thinking of inoculate. That's a verb. What I'm saying is innocuous. It's an adjective. It means not a big deal. Not a big deal. Dude, I'll have you know, Brett, I waited in that bathroom for 45 minutes for an employee to come in and wash my hands. <laughs> um, Jamie, how is it that you're not dead yet? The sign wasn't saying that an employee had to come in and wash your hands. It was saying the employee had to come in and wash his own hands. Oh, because he touched his own man parts. 
Yeah, Jamie, because he touched his own man parts. Oh, well, well, that makes more sense, doesn't it? Yeah, Jamie, most things do. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's all the time we got for today. Join us next month for a special edition of Wheels Off Liberty up in New Hampshire. We'll be talking to libertarian philosopher, superstar, Stefan Mullen. And in the meantime, remember, don't trade in your liberties for those dirty government comforts. <laughs>
you know, by ACLU people, like, they won't even say what the statutory authority is that gives them the power to do that because they're saying we can't let the terrorists know what the legal rule is that's allowing us to fight them. All right, so that just shows how far things have gone in that respect. So again, I would encourage you, think of it this way. When you take your kids to the park and, you know, they, they go and grab somebody's toy, what do you say to them? You say, no, you can't do that. It's not yours. That's not your property. All right, so the things we teach little children, notice for some reason we think that there's a big asterisk and that doesn't apply when uh, government officials do it. So again, if, if you believe that yourself and just think through the logic of it, I think probably many of people you know, in the United States, that is what they think and around the world, they do have that asterisk. They think that certain rules of behavior apply at one level in our interpersonal lives among our neighbors and that you teach your children a certain thing, like strong, absolute moral rules, and then for some reason we think that, oh, well, no, that actually wouldn't work. And what's also strange is that everybody agrees an authoritarian society doesn't work. Right? People know that if we had the government picking occupations for everybody, that that wouldn't work. And you can imagine somebody, you know, back in the Middle Ages, let's say, when under, under the feudal or guild system, you could imagine if there was some sort of like free market economist who had revolutionary insights at the time and looked around and said, you know, I think people should be allowed to go into whatever occupation they want. And you can imagine the people saying, what are you, crazy? Well, how do we know there'd be enough food grown? How do we know there'd be enough cobblers to make shoes? You know, how do you know there'd be enough blacksmiths? We need to have a regimented system to ensure that that would work. And you could imagine the wild-eyed dreamer saying, no, 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 let's just have freedom. It's, it's not right that we're telling people what they can do with their livelihood. That just, not, that just strikes me as unjust. And you can imagine the response from people saying, come on, history has shown that our system works. You're a dreamer. Oh, yeah, we're just going to trust. How, what would happen? What if there's a shortage of, of food? And the person, the economist, would say, well, you know, prices would adjust. You know, the price of tomatoes would go up, and then you'd make more in agriculture, and some more labor would go into agriculture, and you'd give a nice thing. And that would sound insane. That would sound like some nut job ivory tower theory. And yet now, because we've grown up in a relatively free society where you can switch occupations, people see that, oh, yeah, that, that does work. All right, so what I'm saying is all the things right now, for those of us, you know, we've all grown up in a system where the government runs the courts, the government runs the prisons, and it just seems inconceivable to us, to, you know, unless you've really thought through this stuff and read a lot of the literature, it sounds crazy. That, oh, you would just let the market and free, freedom reign in these areas. Would know you need to have a strong government to make sure that there's a rule of law. And if you think about it, if you understand that it would be crazy and unproductive and uh, inviting corruption to have the government, say, monopolize the production of computers or monopolize the production of automobiles, then why in the world would you entrust that same government with uh, locking people up or giving them the death penalty? Right? That's the last thing, or giving them nuclear weapons. Right? So if they can't be trusted with computers and cars, they certainly can't be trusted with nuclear weapons, and yet that is the default position of many people in this country and around the world. And so again, I would just encourage you to uh, rethink that and not to dismiss it. I don't hope to convince you just with these uh, remarks I'm making right now, but there's a whole scholarship of people in the libertarian movement, uh, Austrian economics in particular is what I'm familiar with, talking about these things. Uh, voluntarism, there's various names that it goes under. People are, are waking up in different sectors and seeing that the government, in any area it touches, right? So I've known, uh, recently I've become more aware of the fact there's plenty of people on the left who are starting to understand the danger of the government because of nutrition, right? That, they, that for years they have known that the food pyramid issued by the government and all the stuff the government's telling you about how you should eat and the USDA recommended daily allowance and all that stuff, they're recognizing that that, it's not just that it's not quite right, it's that it's downright harmful. Like you want to do the opposite almost of what the official government guidelines are. And so that, what I'm saying is that is true in all the different disciplines. Everything the government touches. So I'm an economist by training, and so that's what I focus on. And again, the things the government does, this is, oh, we have to run a big deficit. We have to lower interest rates. We have to do all these stimulus and QE packages, and that's what you do to help a downturn economy. It's not just that I'm saying, oh, I think they're a little bit off. No, that's the exact wrong thing to do. All right? And then people who are studying you know, uh, criminal uh, behavior and how does it that you fight crime and things, the things that the government does to allegedly fight crime are actually the, the diametrically opposed thing to what they want to do. Okay, let me now end with just one more thought. So I think a lot of people in this room like what I just said there. 
Uh, some of you know my own views, so let me just close with one more statement. And this is the kind of thing, some of you are going to like it a lot, some of you aren't. If you don't, I hope maybe just to plant a seed and maybe years from now you'll look back and maybe you'll see things differently. The last thought I want to leave before I turn it over to Taryn Lupo is God loves you more than you can possibly imagine. Good night, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> I saw it and I don't believe it. <laughs> Thank you, Bob Murphy. Come all you young people, it's time to rejoice. And claim your inheritance, raise up your voice. The lantern of liberty is leading the way. In a year for the youth, this is New Year's Day. We can